So we're looking at rotational inertia here. Um, it helps to compare it to mass to get an idea of uh, what's going on. If you have a, an object with a mass m and you're trying to accelerate it from zero uh, up to some particular velocity v, um, to give it that velocity v you've had to do some work. Um, you've had to give it some kinetic energy and uh, you let's see you've had to give it some momentum now momentum in the traditional discussion um, you talk about uh, momentum the amount of momentum an object has relates to how hard it is to get it to change and the there are two components to that velocity and mass so the larger a mass is the harder it is to get it to change um, its velocity to change direction or to change the magnitude of the velocity. Now we have a similar thing, and, and that's that's to do with the mass. Okay. We also have um, for rotating systems, um, we have the inertia I, which is exactly the same as mass. Um, very roughly speaking, it's to do with the amount of mass and how that mass is distributed. Um, throughout the rotating system. So for example if we have a disc here um, we've got the disc has a mass m and it has a particular radius which determines um, how that how that mass is distributed. So for um, a this, this might be a, a solid wheel and we would give uh, an inertia formula for this of um, I for inertia equaling <coughs> excuse me a uh, half m r squared. So it's the mass at each radius sort of added up and this formula gives us a nice way to represent that for a regular shape. Um, some shapes are not regular and you have a lot of trouble with that. But For another one if you had um, a say a bike wheel um, which we might consider a, um, a hollow cylinder of very thin uh, width. For a bike wheel um, your rotational inertia is going to be um, mr squared okay because it's all the mass is only at one radius that's um, yeah often there's assumptions you'll have to make like um, bike uh, with a bike wheel that the spokes are uh, of zero mass otherwise you have a lot of trouble calculating it exactly if you're doing some sports science for the Tour de France um, bikes and there's a lot of money and a lot of uh, uh, weight on who wins and all of the emphasis um, there so you would have to actually take into account all those things when you're calculating the inertia of a bike. Why does inertia on a bike matter? Um, because uh, if you have a wheel so if you have a wheel that has a high inertia what that means is it, it's going to take a lot of energy so it takes a lot of energy to get it moving. Okay, but the converse side of that takes a lot of energy to stop it as well. So it's more efficient for the rider to have a bike wheel that has a lot of inertia. Okay, but if you have too much inertia, it takes a long time to speed up. And if they have a little sprint race where they have to put on a sudden burst of speed, it's no good. So generally they just try and make them really, really light um, and uh, aerodynamic and all that kind of stuff as well, but that's kind of irrelevant to what we're talking about here. Another um, two common inertia formulas, you don't usually have to memorize these for exams, might be for a solid sphere. Okay, a solid sphere, your inertia for that. And they often look like uh, the formula that you might find um, for volume as well. I'm sure there's links with all of that. So that's two fifths m r squared for a hollow sphere. Hollow sphere, your inertia is equal to uh, two thirds m r squared. Two thirds m r squared, and you don't need to remember these for the exams um, under NCEA, um, but they're handy to know anyway. So what you could do is you could rank uh, these different things, whether it's a, a solid wheel, where are we? whether it's a solid wheel, a, a bike wheel like a hollow cylinder, um, a hollow sphere or a solid sphere, you could rank them in terms of increasing and decreasing inertia. 
Okay, so uh, let, let's just do that because it'll be helpful for us. I'm um, going to go even smaller again. Um, let's consider, let's do it this way. We've got a, um, well, we'll look at the formula first because the formula will, will determine what's going on. We've got two fifths MR squared, we've got two thirds MR squared. So two fifths is definitely smaller than two thirds because two fifths is under half of it. Um, so uh, if we were to just circle them and kind of put them in order, um, our, our solid sphere is uh, is going to be a lesser inertia, and um, that actually matches up with uh, the, our lowest. So that that's going to be our lowest. Let's put our lowest here. We'll go lowest to highest. So we've got solid. Solid, no, I've got my eye in the wrong place. You know what I mean. Solid sphere, and then next is going to go for the solid wheel because that's half, two thirds is over half. So we go solid wheel. I've got um, solid spelled right that time, and then we go to the hollow sphere, and then we go to the um, the the uh, the bike wheel. So that's the 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 hollow cylinder or wheel or something like that okay so what this means is um, if you were to roll all of these down a slope and they're all of the same mass the hollow cylinder would take the longest to wind up okay because it takes the most energy to get it going because it has the most inertia it's the same as mass okay the thing that which has the greatest mass all else being equal is going to take longer to accelerate it um, or it's going to take more energy to accelerate it, so it will take longer if it's under the same force. Okay, that's enough for now. We'll talk about um, energy and um, maybe look at Newton's second law and some angular momentum as well, um, but looking at the inertia with these things.